Okay, can everybody hear me down the back? Yes, okay, cute. Um, greetings, uh, my name is Hayley Marama Kavino. I'm the program coordinator for Democratizing Knowledge. Uh, this is an event of the Democratizing Knowledge Project in collaboration with the Office of Multicultural Affairs. I just want to give my um, warmest uh, gratitude to Cedric Bolton, who has partnered with us on this event. Um, I want to welcome everybody here. It's great to see such a good crowd um, for AD. Marcel Haddix is going to do a formal introduction. I just have a couple of notices um, before we resume. Um, I want to just acknowledge um, and express gratitude for being on Onondaga land and to Onondaga for hosting us today. Um, I have a couple of DK events that are coming up that I want to announce. Uh, the first is on March 26th at 5 p.m. in this space. Uh, the title of the talk is Reproductive Justice in Our Communities. Um, we're delighted to be welcoming back Dr. Griselda Rodriguez um, from Ashe Birthing Services in New York City. Um, some of you may have seen a viral video uh, from September 2017. Um, the name of the video is Romper's Doula Diaries. It had 5.6 million views. So part of the work that Griselda is doing in New York City is work with people of colour and women of colour in their communities around birthing. Um, Griselda will be partnering in this panel event with Astia Bay, who is founder of Co-Mothering CNY and also uh, a partner of Village Birth International, a community doula, trainer and mentor and a registered nurse. On April 23rd, we will be hosting Medine Paulus and her film screening of her film As Marina. So she will be here, she will be screening the film and then there will be a Q&A. That event will take place at 5 p.m. in Watson Theatre. A little bit about Medine. She is an Afro-Italian filmmaker, and her film, As Marina, depicts the presence of the Habisha community in the city of Milan through the collective memories of the community recorded in personal archives through photograph, music, and stories. So we invite you all um, to be present and to come and participate at those events. More information will be on our website. Uh, including posters and uh, a reminder of the dates and deta venue details. So um, it's my pleasure to invite my sister Marcel to come and speak about our guest today. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So I had to write my remarks because, as many of you know, I'm pretty crazy these days, so I want to make sure to get it right. But I'm quite excited about this evening's talk with A.D. Carson. But before I introduce him like Haley, I want to acknowledge all of the individuals who made uh, tonight's event possible. First and foremost being Haley Cavino. So thank you for all of your work. Uh, to members of the Democratizing Knowledge Collective that are here as well. And I'd also like to thank and acknowledge the Office of Multicultural Affairs and the Black History Month programming committee, specifically Cedric Bolton, for co-sponsoring this event. So please check out uh, the Black History Month calendar as well for some other exciting events this month. And I want to just thank all of you for being here. When I first learned of A.D. Carson and his work, I'll admit, it was via a media storm of news headlines that read, this PhD candidate made a 34-track rap album for his dissertation. An activist defends his dissertation in rap. A rap album PhD dissertation at Clemson. I thought, awesome. But it wasn't lost on me that the headlines and related news stories worked to perpetuate a narrow treatment of his dissertation, of hip hop, and of activism. The emphasis on a 34 track rap album as if somehow all of the knowledge history and experience that A.D. brought to his work was reducible to a simplistic understanding of what a 34-track album is. Or that, rip, uh, or that rap and or hip hop, though I never felt that those reporting on this story understood its connection, was devoid of a social context, a historical record, an activist moment, movement. I was quite intrigued by A.D.'s journey, what little I knew of it, and rooting silently in the background for all that this brother was doing and for all that was yet to come. 
So fast forward to June of 2017, I had the great opportunity to meet A.D. and to hear him speak at the Democratizing Knowledge Mellon Summer Institute that was at Rutgers University. I was enthralled by his lyricism, his spoken word, his performances, all hip hop forms he infused into and throughout his presentation, as I'm sure he will this evening. But I was most taken aback by the deeply personal and political engagement that is ever present in his work. In AD, there is a reclamation of hip hop and its many forms to call out racial violence, white supremacy, and the matrices of oppression that communities of color face within and beyond these United States. AD is intentional and unapologetic about speaking up and out against injustices. And he is very clear about why he does this work. And as I remember him sharing at Rutgers when asked about how he would continue to do this work within the structures of the academy, he is very clear about where his commitments lie and be sure they are not within the academy first. I'm sure he'll elaborate on that this evening. AD is currently an assistant professor of hip hop at the University of Virginia. He is a performance artist and educator, born and raised in Decatur, Illinois, so a fellow Met Midwesterner, <laughs> whose work focuses on race, literature, history, and rhetorical performances. He received his PhD, as many of you know, in rhetorics, communication, and information design at Clemson University. His most recent project is called Sleepwalking, Volume 1, A Mixtape. And that work extends from beyond his, dis his doctoral dissertation, which he'll talk about this evening, Only My Masters, The Rhetorics of Rhymes and Revolutions. AD's work has been featured by Complex, The Chronicle of Higher Education, Forbes, The Guardian, NPR's All Things Considered, OK Player, Time, US Today, XXL, among many others. You can stream his work. You can download his work. You can follow him on Twitter. To me, his work is an exemplar of publicly engaged scholarship. So if you aren't following him, make sure to do that this evening. So be prepared to be inspired. AD is blazing trails as an artist, an activist, a scholar, and a teacher. And we're so honored to have you here with us this evening. Let's welcome AD Carson. Thank you. All right, how are y'all doing? Excellent. Oh, all right, peace, peace. Um, so I want to thank uh, Haley and Marcel uh, for extending the invitation, as well as everybody affiliated with uh, the Democratizing Knowledge Project uh, in the Office of Multicultural Affairs here at Syracuse. Um, just thank you all for having me here today. Uh, and, and also the graduate students that um, I was able to have lunch with earlier. It's a really thought-provoking conversation. Yeah, so there are a lot of things. I always feel the need to like want to explain beforehand, but we'll do a Q&A afterward. So the MC steps into the circle with stories to tell for his work to work. It must be dope. He must be dope. Uh, here, dopeness is a response to Avatar Renault's question about our drugs. It is a special mode of addiction, the structure that is philosophically and metaphysically at the basis of our culture. She prefaces her question by stating that, quote, our drugs uncover an implicit structure that was thought to be one technological extension among others, one legal struggle, or one form of cultural aberration classifiable in the plural, drugs, a singular plural, they were nonetheless expected to take place within a restricted economy. If I were going to do a historiography of hip hop, one might look like this and include texts like uh, Trisha Rose's Black Noise, or, um, I'm sorry, the, or, or also the Hip Hop Wars. She wrote that one as well. Uh, Adam Crimson's uh, rap music in The Poetics of Identity, Making Beats by Joseph Schloss, Kira Gantz, The Games Black Girls Play, 
a Book of Rhymes by Adam Bradley and Prophets of the Hood by Amani Perry. All these texts have been invaluable in the field of study and my understanding of the genre uh, while engaged in these texts and the music that I was listening to and making and also living in South Carolina on a former plantation no less, I felt compelled to introduce some additional figures into this historiography that would ground my project and help, uh, help me get at the questions that I would be raising. So I tried in this earlier work, Cold, to write in hip hop and owning my masters is another attempt and consequently stands as evidence of the policed body, the voice that comes from the body, resisting arrest and surveillance, making itself known as that upon which law is dependent, its evaluation and adjudication in certain spaces, certainly by an academic institution, can be viewed as a pushing forward because of the tension created by its thesis and execution. history. But come to the campus of Clemson University and you'd hardly be able to tell it from looking around. Solid orange you'll see. The grounds are perfectly manicured, alluring, and monuments to the greatness that creates such institutions stand as reminders from whence we came. And since we gain so much from what we see, we smile, proud of the great tradition of which we have the benefit of saying we are now a part. Solid orange we are. And it's easy to buy in. It starts with the song that shakes the Southland and the sea of solid orange, tiger rags that kind of grab you and say, you are now a member of this family. You are now a Clemson Tiger. Wear your orange proudly. But it's a pretty well-known fact that tigers have stripes and almost as well-known as the reason they do, yet Clemson University home of the Tigers doesn't do much acknowledging of those dark marks it knows to be so integral a part of its existence. Solid orange, we say, at this university that was once a plantation, slavery being the positive good, according to Master Calhoun, whose house sits still on a plot atop a hill overlooking the football field, open seven days a week, and I can even enter through the front door. What I cannot do, however, is depend on the tour guide to give me the whole history of the foundations of my university because, for some reason or another, it's uncomfortable for some people to talk about slave owners, supremacists, and segregationists on those terms. Or, it's unknown to the individual responsible for the dissemination of that information about this place. But 20 score and many more years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this continent our forefathers and our foremothers and exploited them for hundreds of years, which led to our being conceived in captivity and dedicated to the proposition that history is a matter of telling the story that makes us look best. Solid orange, I think. And that forces me to confront my active participation in not only the crime, but the cover-up the whitewashing with orange of the dark parts of a history meant to be instructional lest we repeat it. And I repeatedly walk past the Strom Thurmond Institute of Government and Public Affairs and wonder, was it there that our ancestors were whipped? Because it happened. Slavery was big business and being black meant you made profits to keep your master in the black. And if the master went into the red, he'd see red and you'd likely wear red stripes across your back. Back. And if that is an uncomfortable truth for the institution, so be it. These are the stripes we bear. So see them. Slavery, sharecropping, and convict labor paved the streets and sidewalks of this high seminary of learning, and earning a degree from here tethers me to the legacy of that and John C. Calhoun, Strom Thurmond, Thomas Green Clemson, and Pitchfork Ben Tillman, who, with his henchmen, killed black members of a militia, never to be convicted but elected to public office, governor, to have statues and buildings erected in his honor eventually. The one on this beautiful campus houses the Calhoun Honors College and the School of Education. So be it if it's uncomfortable to bear those stripes. See them. 
because it's not uncomfortable to reap the benefits of the labor that went into building the buildings, attending the land, but very much so knowing the buildings and the land are stained with years upon years of the blood, sweat, and tears of slaves and sharecroppers and so-called criminals who were linked to the institution to do the work that you've been doing. Solid orange, they say. And I say, the tiger cannot survive without its stripes. We cannot ignore the troubling history that brought us to this, our glorious institution, with its memorials and monuments to honorable men, and call ourselves a family. And we're damned if we think we're doing ourselves any favors, coloring the history one hue. One you, one we, one he, one she, one them, won't be one us till we strive to see those stripes. The tiger cannot survive without them. The sight of the most exciting 25 seconds in college football was made possible by profits from the most shameful centuries in America's history. Those are the stripes we bear. And before you decide to wear that orange tee or that painted paw, think for a moment about those stripes. Think of the backs of the slaves. Think about the strips of land and the sharecroppers tied to it after so-called emancipation. Think of the uniform of that 13-year-old boy, a slave of the state forced to help build the first buildings at this place. Think of the dark matters that matter more than you know, the difference between willing ignorance and active participation, complicit denial and abject perpetuation. Before you think solid orange, think of how ridiculous a solid orange tiger would look. Think of seeing its stripes. Think of being its stripes. And think of how terrible it is to not be seen, to not be acknowledged. Think about never being doomed to repeat an atrocious history and being better because of knowing better and doing better. Because as things are now, we are the tigers, built on a legacy of slavery, sharecropping, and convict labor by slave owners, supremacists, and segregationists, but come to the campus of Clemson University and you'd hardly be able to tell it from looking around. And it's a shame. We'd be a beautiful tiger if only we could see our stripes. So, <clears throat> Stefano Harney and Fred Moten guide us underground to help articulate this point. They offer perspectives on how one might engage the university in fugitivity. They write, quote, the subversive intellectual came under false pretenses with bad documents, out of love. Her labor is as necessary as it is unwelcome. The university needs what she bears but cannot bear what she brings. End quote. They write that eventually, quote, she disappears into the underground, into the undercommons of enlightenment, where the work gets done, where the work gets subverted, where the revolution is still black, still strong, end quote. This project, this tension, is black study, the work of fugitive planning. It is work for and against the university, for and against disciplines, for and against verification and validation. The object of owning my masters is the aim of owning my masters. The work is underground. This introduction is a bad document identifying the fugitive as a citizen. Hortense Spillers is a significant contributor to this creative space, particularly her contention that, quote, certain idols of narrative have lost their explanatory power for American culture in general, and for African American culture in particular, if its contemporary music tells us anything. So that the question for the black creative intellectual now is how does one grasp her membership in or relatedness to a culture that defines itself by the very logics of the historical? Spillers poses this question in a 1994 essay, which is a look back at Harold Cruz's 1967 work, The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. And it situates the latter's import on the moment in which the former is written. She asks, in other words, quote, what is the work of the black creative intellectual for all we know now? Her answer to her own question is that the black creative intellectual must get busy where he or she is. There is no other work. If he or she is defined, has defined an essential aspect of their personhood as the commitment to reading, writing, and teaching, she goes on to encourage the black creative intellectual to seize the intellectual object of work and language by embracing the black musician and his music as the most desirable model 
object. She explains, while African American music across long centuries offers the single form of cultural production that the life world can read through thick and thin, and while so consistent a genius glimmers through the music that it seems ordained by divine authority, its very self, the intellectual rightly grasps the figure of the musician for the wrong reasons. Not once do we get the impression that the musician performer promotes his own ego over the music or that he prefers it to the requirements, conventions, and history of practices that converge on the music. If that were so, then little in this arena of activity would exhibit the staying power that our arts of performance have shown over the long haul. In other words, though ego consciousness is necessary, it is the performance that counts here, apparently. As we know black musicians and remember them by the instruments of performance, and performance marks exactly the standard of work and evaluation that has not changed, was a long quote. Spillers calls for performative excellence and states, quote, that this is the page of music from which the black creative intellectual must learn to read. And then from there, she parenthetically conjures the journey of Solomon Northup, referencing a story in his narrative from the 1850s in which bonded persons were made to dance for their masters. This historical connection is salient primarily because she's providing the foundations on which she bases her appeal to the black creative intellectual to model their, model their work on the black musician. Quote, music in black culture achieved its superior degree of development in part because its ancestral forces were occasioned, allowed, the culture's relationship to language is the radically different story too familiar to repeat. End quote. The aim of owning my masters is the object of owning my masters. The project is a digital archive of original rap music and spoken word poetry. This hip hop album is a critical theoretical reflection on personhood. Um, about black bodies and black lives. Rather than theorizing about hip hop, this project does this work through the genre of hip hop, if we can call hip hop a genre. This project argues for attentiveness to historical and contemporary social justice issues, particularly blackness as it pertains to embodied and disembodied voice and performance through hip hop lyrics and spoken word poetry. I contend that while hip hop studies has pushed through boundaries posed by many academic conventions, the performance of some of its cultural products tend to exist at the margins of what is considered proper scholarly engagement in the discipline, which works to reproduce certain forms of and assumptions about knowledge production regarding hip hop. The project contains 34 tracks in its primary playlist, as well as seven additional playlists, which were the pictures you saw previously, a video channel, a chronological timeline annotated with media and bibliographical resources, and photo galleries. Also invited into the cipher are Gregory Ulmer and Kathy Park Hung to examine what the former calls, quote, the representation of the object, in study, object of study in a critical text and to consider the avant-garde movements whose history the latter reminds us, quote, to encounter is to encounter a racist tradition. Ulmer's object of post-criticism speaks of a transformation in criticism in the way that uh, literature and the arts are transformed. As we journey with Ulmer, Hung reminds us that what we're moving toward has been an overwhelmingly white enterprise ignoring major swaths of innovators namely poets from past African-American literary movements whose prodigious writings have vitalized the margins, challenged institutions, and introduced radical languages and forms that avant-gardists have usurped without proper acknowledgement. And so we beckon to the center, Ralph Ellison. He's speaking sonic Afro-modernity into Alexander Wahelier's, or into Alexander Wahelier who brings with him Sylvia Winter, Hortense Spillers, and W.E.B. Du Bois, among others, to ask what happens once the black voice becomes disembodied, severed from its source, recontextualized, and re-embodied, and appropriated, or even before this point. And this is one question to which these words, these rhymes, this project respond. And to respond, 
We turn back to Ulmer, this music, these sounds, these words and rhymes, this project being, quote, the compositional pair collage montage that he borrows, specifically the transfer of materials from one context to another and the dissemination of these borrowings through a new setting. Thus, we will shift away from commentary and explanation which rely on concepts to work instead by means of examples, approaching the object of study at the level of examples it uses. They want what's similar to what's been on the radio. Say it's no big deal, but if I'm for real, it is. But pay me no credit, cash, debit, slash. Let it pass with no assist, no resistance, no a listener can see the difference. I really wish I gave a fuck about what other people do. I really don't, but want you to feel like I wrote this song for you. But it was writer's block that prompted it in me who wanted it. My promise is my narcissistic nature won't be charmed by which ever one's opinionated statements about how I made it. I'm elated if you hate it. I'm complacent if you love it. I put myself way above it. See it like an ant farm. Can't harm, but you can't touch. And I give it up before I let it be perverted. You heard it from me directly. It's silly if I ask you to, but I don't respect me. Let me make myself real clear here. You niggas cooning and buffooning and doing more damage to you than who you think is your enemy. Foolish to think that men will see you and emulate your example. You see it clear like a sample. The opportunity's ample, so you don't put up a fight. Just sell what's already there, cause it's your copy to write. Rite of passage is the massive misinformation you faced and made believe. You understood that was the ace up your sleeve. So you sat down at the table to play. They made it look fun. You feared you had the high card. They told you you were the one, and you were. Sometimes you play a game and win, but despite you're winning at it, somehow you find something's missing in life. Like for me, I'll take the L before I take a few dollars. If I gotta endorse a product that I know to be harmful, what's the honor in a nigga being a nigga for sale? May as well put on a heavy chain and work in the field. How do you make a slave stay a slave? Tell him he can make a slave and make some money while he's at it. It's simple and tragic. Yes, yes. Huh. If Willie Lynch was just a myth but his invention still persisted, would it matter if we saw ourselves as chattel and we battled one another? I was raised to hate my brother, so I hate him. And I hate the woman who created him. And maybe from a certain angle, if you strain to see the truth, then you can see that what it really is I'm dealing with has more to do with me. But I'm afraid of truth and hate that you remind me who I am. And that's related to the way I grew up trying to understand how I could make it through this place and do what I was meant to and face the fact that I was snatched from home and brought to tend the land but that's a complicated kind of truth. America the beautiful would hate to help me deal with cuss. I still kind of mutually beneficial if I'm killing niggas and she want them dead as much as she wants me to go away. A bounty's on my head so they can ask for gun control and more restrictions. They can't satiate the hunger that she has for hanging niggas. I'm a proxy and a peon. A patsy taking orders. A patsy scout attacking scouts and trying to save my borders. A hoarder on a hunt for blood. I'm crippled by the thirst and so I'm riffing over turf and bitches bitching it gets worse because my women want to curse a curse nigga I am first a man who ain't a man but kind of manish so it hurts to think about it be surrounded by it even be convicted to see it and believe it talk about it and bear witness fuck till death do us part wellness or in sickness I want to see your thickness twerk something be my mistress be my bitch I'll treat you like the bitch you is and we'll be living then we can have some children and you could raise them brilliant or you could raise them feeling how I feel about us all the strangest kind of fruit to ever fall Say you could raise them how I feel about us all, the strangest kind of fruit to ever fall. You don't see him. He often doubts if he really exists. His is not the radio phonograph. His is capable of five live sounds, of feeling their vibration, 
of being the embodiment of those sounds. But he's not five Louis Armstrongs playing and singing, what did I do to be so black and blue? Yet he's made poetry out of this being invisible. And it's probably because he's unaware that he is invisible. I understand his invisibility, though, I think. He has that slightly different sense of time. And I can at least tell when he's not quite on the beat, sometimes ahead and sometimes behind. But never mind me. This isn't about me. He listens in that newly discovered analytical way of listening to music. I hear each melodic line existing of itself, standing out clearly from the rest, saying its piece, waiting patiently for the other voices to speak. He listens in time and space, entering and descending into its depths like the invisible men before us, like Dante, knowing now that few really listen to this, the invisible music of his isolation, he asks, not what did he do to be so black and blue? I'm sorry, to be so blue. But what do we do with the black? Bear with us. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, rational, just <laughs> and, uh, of course, that leads us uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, very vague on how to deal with it. And, uh, many times we claim uh, actions are revolutionary, uh, but really they're not. They're not. It's true. <laughs> They won't rap, and not a tap dance minstrel show, so they can't help but want to follow where my pencil go. I'm like the ghost of Wu-Tang, Bobby Digital's analog catalog trapped inside your stereo. Not mercurial, but open to change. Came during the drought when you was hoping for rain, praying the HOV. I was opening lanes on the right side, solo, joking and playing. It's like... Beat Street meets Oscar the Grouch. Traditions that used to exist got argued about, then took over. Consumerism hollowed them out. Now everybody's scratching heads like, what's the problem about? Yo, if you can't see the boogeyman, but you spooked, and you can tell a lot about a tree from the roots, then it don't really matter what you do to the fruit, because you ain't eating what you think, and it's like venom to you. <laughs> I represent niggas that been in the booth, spitting truth, so our peers call us venerable. Ladies get disrespected in dinners a few, so they all baritone like a tenor or two. But be careful who you mention that to, cause I got sisters, a mother, and living is proof that they're queens, no burrow, but itching to prove that I'll put you down under like a didgeridoo. <laughs> Murder metaphor, red cape matador, niggas kill niggas every day. Why battle for a title? Cause if you look like me, you're my rival, but mix that with some ignorance and you could be my idol. I'm about to remix America the Beautiful to the takeover beat. I'm sure it'll be suitable. Write three rhymes, solidify me undisputable. Start a revolution, have them play it at my funeral, then print my face on their t-shirts. Black, solid with prophecy spoken by Socrates. What politics is paradoxical. On a beach somewhere tropical. Sipping daiquiris with Tupac, Scott LaRock, and Obama. Solemn, a lake of Mr. Statement. Peace to the people, pray you never be complacent and never strive for parallel if you were born adjacent. Simple statement, I'm saying always strive for greatness. <laughs> yes, yes. Are you not perhaps afraid of what might happen to you as a result of making these revelations? Oh yes, I probably am a dead man all this. No, I don't worry, I tell you, I'm a man who believed that I died these words in this poem are borrowed from the narrator of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. He discovers, quote, a new analytical way of listening to music while under the spell of reefer. He's on dope, 
self-critical as a result of his being what Spillers describes as, quote, discomfited, unoriented, which she suggests the work of the intellectual should make her re reader and hearer. Rennell might call this a conjuring. She says, quote, intoxication names a method of mental labor that is responsible for making phantoms appear. It was a manner of treating the phantom, either by making it emerge or vanish. This is the work of dope. Quote, you're constantly being bumped against by those of poor vision. Or again, you often doubt if you really exist. The narrator continues, you wonder whether you aren't simply a phantom in other people's minds. Say, a figure in a nightmare which the sleeper tries with all his strength to destroy. It's when you feel like this that, out of resentment, you begin to bump people back. He later states, I remember that I am invisible and walk softly so as not to awaken the sleeping ones. Sometimes it is best not to awaken them. There are few things in the world as dangerous as sleepwalkers. I learned in time, though, that it is possible to carry on a fight against them without their realizing it. James Baldwin raps alongside Ellison's narrator, quoting a hymn for the title of his 1964 book, God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire, next time. This is the next time. Prepare for fire, the grotesque fantasy of the shrinking so-called majority, America's nightmare, is slowly transitioning from somnolent slumber to a waking state akin to sleepwalking. America, for as long as it has existed, openly endorsed terror and rode the wave of fear that followed to superpower dominance domestically and abroad. To be clear, when I say America, I mean white America. The America America sees wants to see, not the real America, but the ideal America, the America that stated all men are created equal while enslaving men and women who legally counted two-fifths less than their American masters. America, the beautiful, who crowns her good with brotherhood, but from sea to shining sea, shoots down and locks up young black boys and girls, men and women, with impunity. This is the next time. Prepare for fire. America's nightmare is America waking up. Good morning, America says. Good morning, America says. Good morning, America. Says, good. Morning, America says you're a true patriot. Don't let America die. Don't let America's death be in vain. Fight for America. This is good morning. The black and brown bruises on the American body must be cut off, must be amputated, or risk infection spreading. Sleep, America. This is an age-old procedure, perfected, or inject local anesthetic, remove bruise, move, repeat procedure, or just sleep. It'll all be over when you wake up. This is the next time. Prepare for fire. This is America burning. This is America learning this is no nightmare. This is America waking up, realizing its bruises have not been removed, may not be removable, and trying, trying, trying to remove these imperfections or risk infection spreading. This black becoming blacker, this brown becoming more, this body belonging to this mind that is perfected, seeing itself as pristine. This is America operating white, America cutting into her native skin, excising what does not belong, what she does not want to see. Cut deeper, cut to the white. It burns, but it's worth burning. Not seeing it must be worth the price. This is America screaming. This is America waking up. This is the next time. Prepare for fire. The remains will be black. This is America on the brink of break, ever aware of a two-ness of which there is a constitutional greater and lesser, necessary evils that history won't heal and Hennessy won't help, darkness and lightness created in the likeness of white God and white Jesus who would rather see white America burn than see it turn into what it already is what it always was, America becoming awake, America becoming aware, is America becoming so scared of what she knows she is capable of doing to herself. Dream sweet, America. Dream deep. Breathe deeper. Now deeper. And sleep. Sleep. 
You were made from this. You were made for this. You were made by this. You are on fire. This is the next time. America is burning. So to speak of specific voices, specific bodies, James Baldwin tells us in Stranger in the Village that people are trapped in history and history is trapped in them. The bodies of Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Walter Scott, and Sandra Bland, among the countless others, can tell us quite a bit about this trap if we listen. Also, uh, to Sylvia Winter, who says, uh, the figure of the human 
is tied to epistemological histories that presently value a genre of the human that reifies Western bourgeois tenets. The human is therefore wrought with physiological and narrative matters that systemically excise the world's most marginalized. They are of a genre of human that holds less value. It doesn't matter as much as America's uh, canonical human. To assert that those kinds of lives matter is a matter of perspective, an objective fact to some, counterlogical to others, but nonetheless deeply entangled in physiological and narrative matters. What then do we do with Trayvon's voice on the 911 call after his body has had its life taken from it? Or with Eric's I can't breathe after it's no longer a possibility? Or with Sandra saying, but I'm still here, forcing us to question its truth? What happens once the black voice becomes disembodied, severed from its source, recontextualized and re-embodied and appropriated? or even before this point, is there a use for those bodies, those voices? Franz Fanon might offer them as objects in the midst of other ob objects, despite our shouts that they be considered people among people. Technological bodies or embodied technology in the service of reification of that master genre of the human. Here is my argument. Martin, Garner, Brown, Scott, Bland, all malfunctioning, our cries for justice futile because bad technology, things like these are destroyed, dismissed with no mortification, often with impunity because no one should face recrimination for doing what must be done to maintain the order of things. Cynthia Marie Graham Hurd, Susie Jackson, Ethel Lee Lance, DePayne Middleton Doctor, Clementa C. Pinckney, Taiwanza Sanders, Daniel Simmons, Sharonda Coleman Singleton, Myra Thompson, Emmanuel Nine, their bodies were instruments used to turn the page on an ugly chapter of American history. Common narratives attempt to convince us that they should be commended for their sacrifice in helping us remove the Confederate flag from the South Carolina State House grounds. Michael Brown and Eric Garner, however, were already broken disobeying orders, and therefore undeserving of the respect or dignity afforded proper people by authorities. Their bodies laying on a sidewalk in Staten Island, in the street in Ferguson, are no different than broken televisions or stereo equipment put out on the curb for eventual disposal. You don't see them. They often doubt if they really exist. Winter says, our mythoi, our origin satires, are therefore always formulaically patterned so as to co-function with the endogenous neurochemical behavior regulatory system of our human brain. Humans are then a biomutationally evolved hybrid species, storytellers who now storytellingly invent themselves as being purely biological. With this particular presently biocentric macro origin stories are overrepresented as the singular narrative through which the stakes of human freedom are articulated and marked. The history in which we are trapped is a genre of storytelling that perpetuates the genres of the human and our values thereof. We keep telling ourselves who we are with these stories, and we keep being what we've said we were. What we are now are products of our storytelling, trapped in the trap we've written. Currently, objects don't write their own histories. And since I, too, I'm an object in the midst of other objects. Perhaps this genre of writing is something that can be done with the disembodied voice severed from its source, recontextualized and re-embodied and appropriated. Perhaps this can be the kind of dope that makes the phantom emerge or vanish, that provides a new self-critical, analytical way of listening. <coughs> So there you have it. His invisibility placed us here. In fact, it showed us and helped us accept where we are studying this lesson through his life. He tried to do it in everyone's way but his own. That was his problem. That in being called one thing, then another, while no one really wished to hear what he called himself, rebellion was inevitable, invisible, a return. The end was in the beginning, beneath the surface, underground, under thought, but understood. Under common circumstances, he would say this was about history, about her. But 
This is more under commons than even common sense might say. Black and fugitive study and planning and act too. This is about us, about being without substance, a disembodied voice with no choice but to tell you what you've been looking through. Him on the lower frequencies speaking for you. So you won't ever see me standing for no pledge or singing no national anthem. I'm not a patriot. I'm descended from Nat and them. And I'm Harriet in a chariot with a lariat. Pistol on my waist, heavy as a burden. Carry it. The metaphor I settle for is better for opponents of my mind state. So when I rhyme state, they condone it. I make no bones about the why. Wish a nigga would since they wish a nigga dead before they wish a nigga good But they wishy-washy window watching picket hawking cowards who don't get the plot But switch the topic minutes after hours talking healing prophets while there's killer cops and all the powers that be With all control over how it should be and how it is So I'm here to let a motherfucker know no, that ain't the way it's about to go. <laughs> I'm a descendant of either Huey or Malcolm or Robert Williams. I feel them while even knowing the outcome equal, but they was owning people. From any spot you see hypocrisy like this is see-through. They wanted you to be cool, but not the same for me too. For them to be the ones, then there had to be some people to be too equal, but they was owning people. From any spot you see hypocrisy like this is see-through. They wanted you to be cool, but not the same for me too for them to be the ones then they had to be two thank you for your time I'll also say that you can um that last part is the, um, the, the newer project that I recorded whenever I got to um, Charlottesville. Um, and so it's just an extension from the previous thing, and I believe that they kind of run together. Um, but you can download either of them. It tells you if you donate some money or something like that, that it'll give you like better access. I would say don't pay for it, like bootleg it for real. Like take it, find somebody who downloaded it and ask them to send it to you but you don't have to pay for it. Um, if there are questions, I think there's a microphone here. Or... Where could we find the majority of the um, music? If you go to adthegreat.com, yeah. And I say, like, going to that website is, is much better primarily because, um, like, there, people have linked to, like, a SoundCloud page, and those things on SoundCloud are also, like, just the working tracks. So, like, you're getting drafts of the thing, and it's not the actual thing. So even if you go there and it has, like, the full playlist, uh, the quality of those particular, um, those particular files that were uploaded there were there so that I could just make them public so that the people I was sharing them with would be able to listen. Hi. Um, hi. Hello. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, the um, earlier video that you showed of the work that you're doing um, at the university to mobilize students um, and make them aware of the land that they're on and the history of it, it reminded me of, uh, I'm from South Africa, mm -hmm. and there was a recent uh, protest uh, called Roads Must Fall, mm -hmm. and that happened in 2005, and I couldn't help but see the parallels uh, around that, your movement and that what happened, and I was wondering if you want to talk a little bit more about, like, what you guys do in terms of educating students and 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 protesting a very racialized, institutionalized kind of 
um, or the situations that happen, I guess. Okay, and thank you for mentioning that um, because uh, that, so that, that video uh, is kind of inserted in there before I say that, you know, like I'm going to move from the explanation to the, you know, like the, um, you know, like, uh, or performing the, the work. And the reason that, that I put it there was because um, early on at Clemson, I didn't realize I, I didn't realize that my work was going to actually engage with what was going on there. I just knew that there was something that was not being spoken to, and um, so that the the See the Stripes campaign was something that I proposed to the Clemson administration while I was a, a graduate student there, and um, I think that they thought that well the at least the person that I talked to in the administration thought it was a good idea, but then he took it to the um, executive leadership team and they said that it was too much, that it was um, not um, something that they would be willing to get behind. And he told me, good luck. And, um, and so I put it online. And of course, people responded to it because I think that uh, as much as we love to say that everybody knows the history of all of our universities, uh, many people don't know those things. And after the fact, lots of people said, all the things in that video are readily available. And I thought, like, that's probably true. Like, there was an article that was in the South Carolina Review that uh, contained lots of the information that's there, but people aren't sharing the South Carolina Review article amongst their peers. And uh, it's not getting people to talk about that. Uh, and um, rather than embracing it as a campaign that the university would be um, would benefit from, it, it seems as though those administrators, those people who are part of that executive leadership team, took it as a challenge to try to make it go away. And I think that then that helped. Um, I think that that many students saw in that um, reasons why we should probably not just pay attention to the historical thing, but the things that were going on in the moment, which ultimately led to. Um, just about a, a year and a half later, there was a sit-in that lasted for nine days. And um, myself and four other students were, were arrested um, because, I mean, and, and it's all related. And I, so I included that, that video um, because that was like kind of like an early portion of the work that I was doing that I didn't know was part of this larger project that was speaking to what was going on, not just in Clemson, but how what was going on in Clemson is related to colleges all across the world. And um, the uh, Roads Must Fall campaign was one of those uh, campaigns. And there were many others, many universities. Once I started to search outside of Clemson, particularly once people started to see the video, and then people started seeing other writing, then people at other universities started asking about how we might work together. And so um, we put together a, a website uh, to, comp to compile that information and just really to keep a tally of the like a Twitter feed and a Facebook feed. And um, much of the organizing then happened uh, through Twitter and through uh, the Facebook page. And even now, the Facebook page still runs. And um, I guess it's been, it's not quite a year yet since you know, I've been gone from there. But the things haven't gone away. And of course, they're probably not going to go away. Um, and now I'm really kind of working to see how I can use what I'm doing um, at the University of Virginia using the position that I'm in at the University of Virginia to be an advocate for the folks who are at UVA who are doing this kind of work. Because what I found at every university that, that I've gone to is that there's uh, you know, a cohort of students who are working, who are doing the work of the institution. And again, it is work for and against the institution because as, um, as much as the institutions want to resist it, uh, there are people who are convinced to come to those institutions because there are students who are speaking out and speaking up. And then people say, well, because that is a thing that goes on at that institution, I'll come there. And it's kind of a really, like, it's a terrible thing to have happen in the same way that I know that there were people who saw the project that I did at Clemson and thought, maybe I should investigate whether I should go to Clemson for my graduate studies since this was a thing that could be done. And I would always caution a person that, there was a whole lot of hell to go through in order for that work to be done. And I don't think that work could have been done if I wasn't at Clemson because I wouldn't have felt so much like, fuck you, to Clemson. I wouldn't have felt that way. And then I wouldn't have been told so many times, no, or try it a different way, or good luck with that. 
And so there's a cost. And um, I wouldn't feel comfortable if I wasn't able to be a person who's going to be in a mentorship capacity or be a colleague to the person who's coming. I wouldn't feel comfortable telling somebody to go down there and then endure what other folks were uh, willing to sleep outside in the cold for nine nights um, you know, to, to stand up against. Um, and that's, the, that's always the problem, so, or it's always the question. And I feel that way now even as you know, maybe I'll be asking students to come to UVA or students will come to UVA because they want to work with me. And then I have to consider what that environment might be like for those students and if those students are willing to endure that. And if what I have at the university, like what resources I might have access to, are enough for me to feel confident that they will be supported there. And that, so that's always like the, the tricky dance that, you know, like activism in spaces like this. Because um, I would mentioned earlier, uh, one year after we'd, um, we'd had several demonstrations at Clemson, then for the, like the MLK week at Clemson, uh, there were pictures of our demonstrations on the university's website. And the university was saying, you know, like, I mean, essentially saying Clemson students are active and activists in the community. I, I mean, Unironically, like they were really serious about this. And um, yeah, you know, and I don't know what to say about that. I mean, how do you encourage people to keep fighting against that, knowing that it's always going to be appropriated, um, that your labor is always going to, um, like even as it's working against the institution, the institution always turns it around and, make, and, and whatever it can take for itself, it will. Um, and so I'm still in the space of, of thinking about that. Um, and, I mean, you know, my role is different, and I've had much less time in the role that I have currently. Um, but, but far too often, I find myself struggling with, you know, like, what, you know, what to do and what to continue to do. Um, so I don't know if that's a sufficient response. Um, this is less a question, I guess, I guess about the all the content, which is glorious, <laughs> but about it sort of uh, connects to the things that you were talking about mm -hmm. and what you are seeing your new role as. But I'm as I guess aside from the administration, um, obviously you found a committee of people who were willing to, I'm sure, push against um, conventions about what a dissertation should what form a dissertation mm -hmm. should take. And as, um, as Marcel said at the beginning, um, the form is what sort of got on the headlines mm -hmm. without connecting the form to the content. But I'm sure that there had to be an argument about how do we judge whether this is a suitable representation of uh, an independent work by a <laughs> scholar yeah. in the field that is comparable to the traditional five chapter mm -hmm. licking <laughs> dissertation that we all love. Um, so it is, but, but that's the form that people recognize. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that part of the journey, if you will, um, how to convince people to push against what I'm sure the grad college or whatever yeah. had to say about the form. Okay, well, thank you for that, uh, for that question. I think that <clears throat> one of the, I, I think that that was going, that was already going to be one of the challenges because I knew that when I, as I was coming into to Clemson that I was going to do something that was not going to be what they uh, would consider traditional. And, um, but, but I also had people who were in the, in my program who were really supportive and they knew the work or they knew the kind of work that I was thinking about doing before I came. And, and that was extremely helpful. So the director of my program was able to walk over with me to the graduate, uh, to the graduate school and to talk to someone there who had uh, some say-so about uh, what we're going to do when they see my um, prospectus. And I'd written a very early draft of it. And by this time, the See the Stripes campaign had already started. And there were also um, there were mixtape projects that were online. And um, the first semester mixtape, I think, was 22 tracks. And, um, and then I would printed out the lyrics and then um, was able to have a conversation about um, ways that we need to, um, ways that the, 
the graduate school is going to in, uh, evaluate this work. And because of my director's willingness to go in and speak on behalf of the work and, uh, and what it meant to our program, then um, that person was more willing to look at the prospectus and, um, and, and um, kind of defer to his judgment about what it looks like compared to the other things that are in that program. And, um, and, and so it was much easier. Putting together the committee was uh, much more difficult because, well, ultimately, uh, there are a lot of things that I'm looking, about, look, looking at. I mean, especially if we think about something like that I might call, like, you know, that here I'm calling dope. But, you know, like, how do, how do we define that? And I don't know if, you know, I don't know if I go and I talk to the MCs that I know and say, uh, like, did you read Crack Wars? You know, like, because, like, the dopeness that we're trying to embody is, like, the same kind of thing that she's talking about in this text. Because I don't know that that flies there either. But I know that the folks that, like, the folks in the discipline that I, that I was talking to, they would understand her or they would understand what she was referring to. But then when it came to talking to my peers, the people who are MCs, um, you know, like, that is a matter of, uh, I mean, there are some stylistic things, I guess, like, that, that may, uh, may be questions. And this was, um, I think, well, in a, in a video on the, on the um, owning my master's site, um, you know, I say that uh, Talib Kweli says on this song called, uh, I think it's Beautiful Struggle, where he says, uh, I, I speak at schools a lot because they, I speak at schools a lot because they say I'm intelligent. No, it's because I'm dope. If I was whack, I'd be irrelevant. Um, and so I was thinking, like, so, like, like, partially this could be about relevance, but this is also about the way that the dope affects the room that you're in, or the way that when people are under the spell of the thing that you are doing, uh, how productive that might be, how generative that might be. Um, and it's sort of a, a thing that you can tell, and I, don't, I really don't know how, there's no, um, um, there's no rubric for, like, the dopeness of a rapper to pass through to the next level of scholarship. Uh, but like whenever I'm in front of another MC, like you know someone um, who who I'm hoping is going to respect my practice, um, like there's something that is exchanged whenever that person says, "Well, um, so I, you know, like I heard you rap or something like that." I don't know how these things. I don't know how a duel happens. You know, where a person like walks up and is like, "So I heard you've been rapping out here." Um, and then you know, like you know, like we get twitchy fingers, and then like we we both you know like go like sixteen bars at a time. Um, but there is something like that. I mean, you know, like at, at the end of it, if the work doesn't work, like if the raps are not good, then well, like the world will let you know. I mean, very quickly, and they are. I mean, and this was also part of the reason, like SoundCloud, it's not really a kind space. <laughs> YouTube is not either. And when your work is there, then there are people who are commenting, and then, you know, like, it, it, it moves around. And so the metaphor, I think, is, is apt, you know, to, to speak about it in terms of dopeness. Um, and uh, one of the, I mean, I also happen to have, um, like, the director of the program was a jazz musician before he went into um, studying uh, rhetoric, and then I had um, another committee member who um, was a part of a, a, a fairly well-known rap group before he decided doing, to do his uh, doctoral studies in communications. Uh, and then I had um, uh, someone who was, on, um, was a, a creative writer, and then um, another person who was in the art uh, department. And so we had multiple uh, critical um, individuals who were able to kind of um, assess what was going on from those different perspectives. And I don't think that that like really, like that, I don't know that that gets at everything. But I felt comfortable enough moving forward, and they just cautioned me very heavily as I'm moving through this academic world that people might scrutinize it, or they might frown about it, or they might not engage it as rightly academic. And um, part of that would be because it's so because it's not traditional. But other part will the, another part of it will be because they don't know who says that it's good enough, and you know, like folks kind of have to step out, you know, and. Um, Unfortunately, like I can't call up, you know, like I can't call up, um, I don't know, like I can't call up like Elzai and, um, you know, like Dave East and be like, hey, like would you listen to my rap album? Would you be a reader on my, you know, like or a listener for my, for my project? Hey, because I don't know, like how do they benefit from that, really? Um, but hopefully, you know, if they do engage with the music, I mean, I did um, after it was finished, um, um, I got, a, a call from Mickey Fax, who uh, is a, a rapper that I, whose, whose work I admire, and then he and Lupe Fiasco called, 
and uh, we had a conference call talking about uh, like working together. And I don't know, um, you know, how that plays in anybody else's world or like what the academic equivalent is. But I think if Lupe calls you, like maybe you're cool. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so, so I was I was all right with that. What's going on? Thank uh, you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks. I got so many questions, but I narrowed it down to two. Work, work. <laughs> so, and it kind of relate, and it, and it segues, it segues too. So okay. Go on. Yeah. So, um, first one is, who's the target audience for your work, and how do you go about selecting the vocabulary that you included? And okay. How, and as to, as that as to how that relates to your audience. Yeah. For accessibility purposes. Well, my um, so the target audience like was really. I mean, in each piece, like it's it's different, you know. Like there's a there's a piece on this new project called Grand Wizard, and it only has Donald Trump vocals, and um, like the audience for that is you know a little different than like the audience for the like the very last piece that I performed. But like they 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 are in sequence in the on the um, album um, for that reason. I think the people who who love hip hop who are um, engaging critically with what hip hop might be doing or with what rap might be doing are like the like sort of the general audience but i think that because there are so many people listening to rap music um, that i don't really i don't make a distinction when people say that they like rap or they say that you know like they they love hip hop culture i say well maybe you'll dig this and so i'm 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 really kind of thinking i'm writing for my own ear really like writing for people who like the kind of stuff that i like uh, and then sometimes, you know, like I might try to imitate a flow or try to imitate, like, I mean, thinking like the song Familiar was like me attempting a particular kind of flow for a particular uh, purpose. And so like I'm really like trying to use that form to say something that, uh, something about that form. So I'm not using it because like I necessarily like want to be a trap rapper, but I think that it's productive to um, think about what Baldwin says, like, and to think about what like Langston Hughes is doing in Dream Variations, and then like make that into a rap song that might lead me into a conversation uh, about the content. And that works in the classroom. So in that way, my students, whoever my students are, are the, um, the target audience for that. Um, with regard to the vocabulary, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, many of those poems, or even like See the Stripes, the poem, um, a lot of the, the vocabulary engages with what uh, um, Rhonda Thomas wrote in that South Carolina Review article so that folks would know. And, and I, you know, I checked in with her to ask her if it was all right for, um, for me to do that kind of work with her work so that we could make it accessible. And then to make sure in the YouTube video that I linked to the article if people wanted that article. Um, the stuff about like Ralph Ellison, like the, 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 the other pieces that were projected, the poems that were projected, that language is taken from the prologue and the, um, and the epilogue to Invisible Man. And so those pieces are like to, I mean, like to be read uh, alongside that, that book. Um, and, um, and that's a lot of the, the sleepwalking mixtape is like really engaging with that. Um, but it comes from all kinds of different sources in like sometimes even like just like like particular words that like that, that jump out at me um, I think are probably more more productive but I don't know that like there's like sort of like a word bank for like the particular things or I believe that certain words are off limits because a certain audience might get it or, or might not get it I think that um, I try to make sure that it is going like that that I'm leading folks to a place that they might investigate more um, rather than like sort of doing something that seems like so like deeply like like you know it folds uh, in on itself so much that folks might not have access to it at all and I try my best to make it as accessible as I possibly can I think that I probably could in some ways like mess around with some of the like with some particular flows or some particular like do, doing like some punchline things that would um, that, that would throw audiences off but I realize that people um, don't engage as much whenever that happens. So um, I just try, I try to like open it up so that even the thing that they are getting like might not even be apparent on a first listen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so going back to the um, the stripes song, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you how would you suggest or how do people reconcile with like a, a collegiate patriotism 
with also acknowledging the roots of the place and then even taking that one step further of like an American patriotism and recognizing its own roots in the development of the country. Well, I think that, um, I mean, and in, in, in the presentation, um, you know, it, it may have like sort of like been buried with, with a lot of stuff, but I think that, um, you know, like it's been suggested that, you know, like it's like doing the work in language. And, um, and so like the See the Stripes campaign is based on a campaign that already existed at Clemson. And that was their campaign, like their solid orange campaign. And so it was simply saying that this campaign highlights a way that we erase the experiences of people who are on campus and the history um, of people who might look like those people um, in, you know, like in the history of the university. So the suggestion is that if we did something with the language that we use to describe ourselves, then we, would, um, then we could be reflective of those experiences um, in the present moment and those historical experiences. And that's a, a fairly mild suggestion to say, rather than us all wear orange on Fridays, like maybe we could get some black t-shirts. And maybe we could like acknowledge that a tiger like literally has stripes um, and they're dark. And if we're going to use this metaphor that we have, or we're going to use this mascot, then like let's fully embrace that mascot. And I think that that bumps up against that sort of like the like the buy-in, like the, the the sort of uncritical buy-in that comes across a campus, especially uh, with regard to a football team. But the reason that I thought that that was important was because that was where it was most dangerous. Not just because, not just because the top of that hill or not just because like the, the top of the hill that they run down to go onto that field, you know, and, and to do all of the, you know, like the things that, that are going on on that field. Um, well, but also because um, it seems to be like the thing that people recognize most. And because people recognize it most, like when I was, like when I went out my first weekend there, I guess we were, um, I think the, the, the first football game was against Georgia. I think it was game day. They came to town. And they filmed game day out in front of the building that's named for Benjamin Tillman. And so on ESPN all day, they keep flashing this building that is named for Benjamin Tillman. But no one is contextualizing who Benjamin Tillman is and where we are in the country. It's just ESPN game day. And, um, and I thought that, that was, it was a problem, but it wasn't just that. It was like when we played against Florida State or when Clemson played against Florida State um, previous to that, I think it was like Bill Murray was wearing like a Piggly Wiggly shirt and then he um, like tackles um, Lee Corso and he's wearing like this, like, this, um, this, like this Indian mascot thing. And like while like there's an outcry, most people are like, get over it, it's sports, this is what they do. And like other folks are saying, but this, like this is like, um, like sort of like the macro problem. Like this is what's what's been going on, like in on so many levels on these campuses and places like Florida State, places like Clemson. Things like this happen, and with so little care that when it happens on ESPN, everybody kind of just shakes it off, and ESPN like just airs it. Same thing. I think that like as soon as the dissertation came out, then. Um, Oh, I can't remember the name. One of the ESPN sites like wrote about the dissertation and I thought <laughs> what? Like so like the dissertation is cool but talking about and I think that they were more critical than other outlets that wrote about it. Um, but I think that like but what is on the page? I mean, and it's the same thing with America and the same thing like with the poem Good Morning America is really just like interrogating that language that already exists, like this idea that we are storytellingly invented. Then if we can interrogate that language and then talk about the ways that we are not that or the ways that the language on the page lies about us, then I think we'll be more aware because then those become the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. And if we do become what we tell ourselves about ourselves, then we'll become better or we'll become more critical or we'll become more engaged with the language as it is being print, printed on the page. And then like we, we, we can just be, um, like we can be skeptical like, uh, or critical um, of the ways that we are like telling ourselves that we're good because I think that we all do that. We go around telling ourselves how good we are. And I think that even that language is problematic. Like, yeah, you know, like no person is, like we're not, uh, nobody's perfect. I think that's what we say. And like, it seems to me that that language then uh, assumes that everybody's like close to it though. You know, like that if there's a scale like, of, you know, like, like on one to 10, you know, like of, of perfection that everybody's like right around eight. 
and some folks are at nine. So then when you do an atrocious thing, they're like, ah, okay, well, but nobody's perfect. And um, I think that even if we interrogated that language and thought like maybe most people are like around like three, <laughs> perhaps four, and I'm being generous here. Um, <laughs> But then what would happen, I mean, we know, that we know it when we're in classrooms, like someone who has an 80% in class, when you tell them that they did something wrong, they're less likely to correct that. They're like, oh, no, I'm cool. I'm still going to get a strong C. <laughs> or if they've got a 90% in class, then they're like, oh, no, like this is still Dean's List material. But if we were looking at it like we were at a 3 or a 4, then we would constantly be working to try to be better. And then, like, we wouldn't, when a, when a terrible thing happens, we wouldn't, like, say, oh, nobody's perfect. We would say, okay, what do I have to do to reconcile this, to be better about this? Because, like, I already know that, like, I'm down here, but I don't want to be, like, you know, like, I don't want to go down any further. And we don't do that. And so I think that that's a thing that we do in language that we could change, and it would just make us more attentive to the ways that we're engaging with the world around us. Because then when you, like, slip up and, like, say the racist thing, then it's like, Wow, like how much of my language is problematic as opposed to, oh, I just did that that one time, get over it. It's just a word. Good evening, Professor. Uh, I just want to say uh, your work is, is dope. Um, I appreciate that. <laughs> you're dope. <laughs> Um, I had a lot of questions, like my brother to my left of me, of what to ask you. Uh, first one is, who's your top five lyricist? Um, and to get, I guess, more of a bigger question of like the state of hip hop nowadays, mm -hmm. and it's trained especially internationally, and how do you see hip hop as an outlet for different narratives to be uh, brought out in this world? And so, yeah. Okay, yeah, well, the second question is probably like the easier one to contend with. Um, I think that, um, I, I think that there's like there's so much going on with rap music, like in hip hop culture, like across the world, that, um, you know, like people who bemoan like what hip hop has become or what rap has become, that's really puzzling to me because like we have so much access to so many people doing so many things now. And yet we are more spoiled than ever. And so like, like people will go out of their way to complain about the fact that Cardi B is on the radio or that like Lil Uzi Vert gets interviewed on a red carpet without paying attention to the people they believe are dope and without like sharing those people's work amongst the people who um, like might be paying attention to other people that they don't like as much. And that's, the reason that that's puzzling to me is because we have like, we, we have platforms to promote the stuff that we believe is dope. Yet we just like complain about things that we don't believe is dope. <laughs> That's amazing to me. And so even in my, like in my teaching practice, I make sure that artists I think are dope are on my syllabus. And that those are people who I'm going to call up and that I'm going to bring in when my students, I'm teaching a class called Composing Mixtapes. We're writing an album together right now. Um, in that class, like what we're listening to as we are writing together, are people I believe are dope or who have done dope things like in the process of putting together albums that we can talk about? Um, and, and I guess that, like, and that kind of also leads into the other question. I, I don't really like rank um, MCs like that. And the reason that I don't is because there's so many people who do so many things that I think are, are really interesting. Um, and I also like, I don't think that I'm one of those people who like will say that like just because someone is like is new or is 17 or is 16 that that like their music is trash and that they need to like go listen to Rakim and Tupac and Run DMC or something because that's also an odd thing to like sort of throw those folks away and believe that they're like because because they aren't like adhering to the history that you know um, that other folks are holding up as the thing that we need to have. I mean, I, I feel like that would be kind of hypocritical. And I think that it is when people do it. Um, but like in my own practice, um, I, I try to see or try to hear what people are hearing whenever they like dig a particular artist. Um, but there are people who I listen to um, 
like some of the artists, like again, like people, people whose work that is like not made it, you know, far and wide, uh, is a rapper in Illinois by the name of Truth. He's a producer as well. He worked some on this project. I think he's an incredibly gifted person, and it's not like he doesn't just do hip hop music. I think he's also really interested in R and B and gospel, um, and um, I just think that like. If more people heard him, more people would know that he's dope. The same thing as another guy from uh, downstate Illinois called um, Real Talk. I think that he's like an extremely, I mean, he was like, when the sources, like, um, um, what, what was the thing they used to do? Like the unsigned hype, when they used to do unsigned hype, he was like one of those people when that mattered. Um, um, but like, I think like, like the Slaughterhouse rappers are like really good rappers. Um, like sometimes there's they're like a lot to be desired with regard to content for me, but like I'm also like just thinking about patterns, you know, like the ways that people like populate a beat, and I think that they, but there's something that like um, that um, like somebody like Young Thug or like I would say like Young Dro, uh, there's something that those folks have to offer to that as well. Like when you think about like sort of just like the sound of their voices, like the cadences, like you know, like just rhythmically what's going on, those things are really appealing. And so I'm always thinking about like how it's useful uh, rather than like saying, like, like throwing stuff away. So there, I mean, I probably have more Iggy Azalea albums like in my library than anybody should admit in public. Um, and really, like, um, and it's not because I'm a fan of Iggy Azalea, but like there was something that she was doing that resonated with folks. Now that's problematic probably for a whole lot of folks, what she was doing. But like to hear that and to like to think about it whenever like things are being created or to be able to show that to other people uh, and then have a conversation about that. The same goes, I guess, with Post Malone. Um, but I, like, I would probably be up here, and generally the things that are problematic are the ones that like, we talk about more. And I try to be in a space where like, the people I appreciate are the people that, um, like, whose work I'm, I'm putting out there. So, um, but I'm trying to think, like, I mean, even like, three of the artists that were nominated for Grammys I, I thought were like, you know, pretty good albums. I think it was like, the Jay-Z album, the um, Kendrick Lamar album, and... Um, Rhapsody, yeah, it was a Rhapsody album. The Childish Gambino album I thought was, was really good as well. Um, so I don't know, I'm just like, I try to be a, an appreciator of what a whole lot of people are doing rather than saying like, like because the criteria for ranking is like, there, there are no criteria really that we have that we agree upon. And like, so when people say like top five dead or alive, and I'm like, I don't know, Andre 3000. And then they're like, yeah, but like, what about like rappers who are currently rapping? I'm like, I'm pretty sure he had a couple verses out last year, <laughs> you know. Like, and so people like want to disqualify your top five uh, when they ask you that. Um, or so like the the better question, sorry for this really <laughs> long answer, is like what like what am I listening to? So like, I'm it's really easy for me to like pick up like iTunes and just show you what I listened to like over the past week, but like that's going to vary week to week, because um, yeah, but it's always like high input is question back there. Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to know the courses that you have been teaching. I want to know the courses that you have been teaching this year, last semester mm -hmm. and this semester. I, okay, so I taught a class called Writing Rap uh, last semester, which was like just sort of like an entry level, I mean, anybody, there's no prerequisites, the students, um, it's really like essentially every, I believe everybody can rap. I'm not saying like everybody will be good, but I think that everybody can learn how to rap. Um, and, and it was, I mean, it was, I think, very productive, um, pretty popular, like I think the students liked it. Uh, this semester I'm teaching a class called The Black Voice, where we actually kind of think about like, like what that means, like that terminology and like why it might be problematic, and, um, and sort of what is going on, um, like when we refer to like the black voice, and like sort of asking some of these questions more in depth. Um, and I'm also teaching mixtape composition, or it's called composing mixtapes, where uh, there are 15 students, and we have a rap lab there at UVA, um, where um, we have some equipment, and um, we have uh, lab hours, and the students come in, and they learn how to use that equipment, how to produce and record, and they have to put on a, um, a launch event for their project, which means that they have to have a project. They also have to like think of an audience and who they're going to invite out to it. And um, so they met today, even in my absence, to um, work toward putting that album together. And um, in, I don't know, about 
I guess in about seven weeks, we will know whether it's dope or not. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's been, it's been really, really productive, and, um, and they're really into it. So, uh, but that's what, I'm, what I've taught so far. Thank you. I know that there are more questions, so I'm going to apologize in advance for having to draw us to a conclusion because we do need to be out of space and we need to feed you. Where? <laughs> and so I just want to, again, express my gratitude to you, A.D., for your work, your labor, um, and your brilliance today. Thank, Thank you, you so much Can I get a picture with y'all real quick? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this, is, this is for Instagram. I just, I be pretending like um, I be doing stuff on Instagram. <laughs> so, like, y'all just look natural. Uh-oh, here we go. I got to get my eyes in there. All right. Word, I appreciate y'all. Thanks. 